My talk is about IOL calculations, and uh, I want to talk about where we are in progress and limits in, in what we're doing with them. The, the bottom line is most of us need to do better, and if we look at how well we all do with our calculations in clinical practice, uh, for example, the largest study that came out you know, in 2018 said that 80% were accurate within about a half diopter predicted, and it's certainly worse for complex eyes. Now, the best that I've seen actually comes from one of our speakers, and I helped Adi a little bit with his talk, but it really comes from Adi's work and his group in Israel. And that is uh, 153 eyes, most with normal axial length, using these three formulas, they got over 92% within a half diopter of target, which means that about one in 11 still is off, even with these really excellent results. And again, a mostly normal axial length. And I, one of the points I wanna make is this is probably the best we can achieve, uh, can expect to achieve considering all the sources of error. So when we measure, of course we measure anterior corneal curvature, axial length, anterior chamber depth, lens thickness, corneal diameter. Uh, some formulas are now including posterior corneal curvature, corneal thickness, and other formulas may factor in refraction, age, gender, and even ethnicity in trying to uh, come up with uh, the calculations. So what are the sources of error? The classic article by Sverker Normi pointed out that it was ELP axial length in the time of ultrasonic measurements and refraction. And why refraction? Well, because when we refract, there are errors in, in our refraction. Remember, we're only quarter diopter steps, and that can, can create the at least the illusion, if not the actual uh, measurement of error. So what are the sources of error today? Well, ELP is still there, and now the cornea has really assumed a very important role, um, both anterior and posterior, and again, refraction. Well, axial length is not on the list, of course, because we have optical biometry, which has gone from uh, PCI to optical low coherence and now into swept source OCT with fabulous uh, accuracy. So how do we calculate IOL power? Well, the classic formulas you see here are the, are the sort of the virgins formula where you enter the post-op refraction you desire, the average corneal power, the axial length. Each formula will have its own internal formula for calculating the effective lens position and it spits out the eye well power that you then would implant in the patient and hope that you hit your target. But really we have a, a huge array of formulas now, many of which are still based on this geometric optics using two variable, variables for the ELP, um, uh, five variables in the panacea formula uh, that also includes the posterior anterior corneal ratio and the uh, radius of curvature, which is interesting the Barrett five var variables and the Holiday two that uses seven. There are ray tracing formula, formulas and we'll have the opportunity to hear Tom talk about his formula, which remains the, the leading ray tracing formula in use, obviously. Uh, and then there are artificial intelligence formulas, big data as it were, the Hill RBF now in its newest iteration, the Hill RBF three. The Pearl is also a big data formula that's uh, kind of beginning, gaining some popularity from uh, Damien Gottenell. And then finally, these combination formulas. And actually, you know, a lot of the formulas are really combination formulas, whether it's geometric optics and some regression or big data in order to figure out certain elements to adjust for axial lengths and so on. So formulas are kind of blending together in a certain, in certain respects. Uh, what's ideally the best? Well, Tom's, Tom's approach is really the best because ray tracing incorporates all of our aberrations, the aberrations of the cornea, if there are significant ones, the aberrations of the IOL, anterior and posterior curvatures. So theoretically, that ought to be the best we can do. And we've also looked at measuring the eyes by the segments, looking from the, uh, the aqueous as opposed to the lens, as opposed to the vitreous cavity, and um, that would enable us to really customize the measurement of axial length instead of measuring it with one unified, unique in, uh, index of refraction. But our Barrett, with, at least with our data with the Barrett Universal 2 said that there were some benefits, but really for eyes at the extreme, under 21 and over 31. And that tells me that Dr. Barrett's done a great job of kind of blending in other things for these long and short eyes. Um, but the limitation that all our formulas face and ray tracing among them is the uh, solution to the ELP quandary. Tom will talk about what he's come up with. But the data with ray tracing formulas still remain, although among our best, no better than our other best formulas, even though theoretically they should be. 
but I think they, they currently should, should have a, a special role for those eyes with irregular corneas, and they do great with long eyes. So can we produce, improve our prediction of ELP? Well, there have been studies that have been using OCT on, on eyes preoperatively and intraoperatively to look at whether or not you can improve the ELP prediction, but none have shown better or more accurate IOL calculations, even though that the prediction is better. And unfortunately, as we all know, ELP shifts postoperatively. How many of us have seen that patient 2020 on day one who comes back 2030 on day 21 with now a minus 75 refraction? So it shifts and it's unpredictably in a paper by uh, Nino Hernshaw and Oliver Findel's group found that 17.6% of eyes had a shift in the anterior chamber dip depth of, of one millimeter or more from one hour measured postoperatively to two months. So we can put it where we think the right spot is and it may shift as the eye heals and the capsule contracts. Short eyes are a bigger challenge and we, the data we published found that actually among the formulas that we looked at, the holiday two was a little bit better than the others, but statistically they were all comparable. Um, and, uh, the, and other studies have subsequently shown this also. Um, well, the reason for the poor outcome, of course, is the ELP problem. You've got a high-powered IOL with a small shift uh, in this IOL can induce a, a large refractive change. So we're unfortunately not doing any better with the short eyes and brown, maybe at best 80% most of the time. And that's something we need to warn our patients about. And one other point is uh, Tom Olson and others have done some important papers looking at how you should compensate. If there's an error in one eye, how do you compensate when you change for the other eye? And his recommendation was about a, a, half, di a half of the amount. If you're off by a diopter in the first, change it by a half. I think in these really short eyes, since anatomically they're unique and but like each other, it's probably good to make the adjustment almost fully one eye to the other in order to be more accurate. So that 50% rule may not work in that subset of eyes. I've really stated that. So we're doing better with long eyes and that's because of, well, we started the, the ball rolling of that with our modification of axial length. And we looked at recently at 1600 eyes and we got 93% within a half diopter and also superb though, and that are readily available, available and are the Hill RBF3, the Barrett Universal 2, the Olson formula and the cane all have reported good outcomes in long eyes. Why are we doing better? Well, you've got a low power IOL, so a small shift in the ELP has much less impact on the outcome. What about the post LASIK eye? Well, multiple studies um, have been done, obviously, and, and the best data I've seen is one paper from Sam Maskett and Nicole Fram with the Hygus L and with the Maskett formula with 85% within a half diopter. <clears throat> but if you look at the literature, almost all of the other reports are 75% or less, or even below that. And um, we, uh, if hyperop, that's myopic LASIK, hyperopic LASIK, the best data I've seen were one from uh, the, a group in, in the Netherlands, 73% uh, with a Barrett True K, no history. Our results in post hyperopic LASIK eyes were a very disappointing 57%. Um, so what about this, the, the advances we now have in measuring posterior corneal power? Unfortunately, it hasn't really brought us the benefit we had hoped for. Um, the Iowa Master has total keratometry, which measures the front using the LEDs and the total corneal power using the uh, swept source OCT by measuring the posterior corneal curvature. And Graham Barrett reported his data with the Iowa Master 700, still only 72% within a half diopter. Our data using the HIGAS formula, not the HIGAS L, but using the HIGAS with total keratometry, again, still less than 70% within a half diopter. So we're still kind of frustrated with our post LASIK eyes. It remains curiously a difficult problem to solve, presumably because of this variability in corneal power uh, due to the uh, post operative change. Aura has been used, and again, um, it takes, does take into account posterior cornea because it's literally performing a refraction on the aphakic eye on the operating room table. Our data actually showed that we did more poorly with aura than with our preoperative calculations, but I should point out, we do a lot of measuring preoperatively, including the Avante OCT, which has helped us improve our accuracy a bit. 
So Aura has not been helpful to us, and we've actually stopped using it. Uh, aberometry is helpful, however, for error prevention. And there was an example I can give in my own practice where the asterisk calculator predicted 23 diopters. The Aura recommended 24.5, and that caused me to do a lot of head scratching. We went back and looked at the data on, in the operating room and found out that an incorrect value for the axial length had been inserted into the Ascaris website. So anything you can do to prevent errors uh, from occurring, and or as one of them, is uh, certainly valuable. And I think the problem, of course, is that we're measuring these eyes using standard IOL calculation formulas after surgery has been performed and it's a modified cornea, et cetera. And we're still trying to figure out where the ELP or where, where the lens is going to sit and that doesn't have any magic on that because it's uh, using the classic types of formulas. Keratoconus is an even bigger challenge. Uh, data compiled by Sumitra Candlewall and our group from the three different groups, including a group from the Netherlands, Rudy Knight's group. Um, with 70 eyes, you can see the error. This is the corneal power along the uh, mean corneal power along the x-axis, and this is the hyperopic error. You can see as the steeper the cornea is, the greater the hyperopic error. Uh, this is the holiday one, but it really was true with other formulas as well. Um, and the, the R squared is pretty good for, for the uh, regression line here up to about 50 diopters, but above 50 diopters, the R squared is very poor, indicating the huge scatter in the data. Now, we're fortunate to have some new uh, keratoconus formulas out, the Kane and the Barrett, and hopefully they will give us some, uh, some better outcomes, and that, that remains to be seen, of course. Well, that brings us back to what we can control today in our practices. Here's a patient of mine who came in to see me on the pre-op visit, Ks are 4334, astigmatism of two diopters against the rule. Didn't get any Ks with the Iowa master. And I looked at the, uh, at the data and there's a, a missing LED Meyer here down in this lower quadrant. Um, this patient had seen me three months preoperatively and the Ks were 44 0.6 with a Galilei as opposed to the 4334 we got on the day of the pre-op visit. And you can see the Myers from the Galilei, Galilei, by the way, are very good. The astigmatism was a tenth of a diopter with a Galilei as opposed to the two over two diopters we got with a Lensstar. Well, looking at the raw data from the Lensstar, you can see the missing Myers in the same area that the Isle Master was missing them. I looked at them, he had some dry spots on the cornea, so I treated the dryness. And uh, actually only six days later, there's still a little bit of irregularity down there, but much, much better. You can see that all the Myers are in fact in place. And uh, I put an EDOF in this patient and it was right on target 2020 J2. So corneal power is a major source of error. We need more than one measurement and optimizing the cornea for your surgery is really critical. And all of my patients get a little handout that says, use warm compresses, use preservative free tears, and use lid cleansers for the couple of weeks before surgery in order to try to really get their corneas in good shape. It's a lesson I learned from cases like this. And of course, you must verify the quality of your raw data. You can't just accept the numbers these devices give out. You have to look at standard deviations. You have to look at the LED Myers, et cetera. Here's another example where the Lensstar um, had uh, gave me 27 millimeters for one uh, the right eye and 26.59. Of course, it gives you a warning signal. The, you can see there's a high standard deviation, which is higher than what we would expect of 0.02 millimeters um, and fairly consistent, but these, these funny readings, the Iowa Master 700, on the other hand, gave 26.93, which is pretty close to the right eye. So we repeated the measurement in the lens star and got 2691. And the problem was that the measurement had been done with the optical head too close to the eye. So there are lots of ways you can have errors and you need to really be attentive to your raw data. And we have validation criteria that we use. We confirm the measurement mode for the, the, the biometer, axial lengths within 0.2, the standard deviation 0.02, and then 2.5 to 4.5 for the ACD and four to 4.5 for lens thickness. Well, what about post-operative modification of IOL power? You've had it a lot longer in Europe than we have. Is it gonna be useful for everybody? I think probably it's, a, it's gonna be more isolated for the outlier eyes because we're doing so much better with our formulas. We have the RX site approved. And of course, these other technologies are being developed. So 
Uh, a final word, we had one of the articles published in the January JCRS uh, was with Jack Holliday and myself and others, Lee Wong. And we have found that you need to actually analyze your IOL calculation outcomes using just the standard deviation. And that's the single best parameter to characterize the performance of an IOL calculation formula. And I think we're gonna see a shift from mean absolute and median absolute errors to using good old fashioned standard deviations. And with that, thanks for your attention and uh, I'll stop. Doug, thank you very much. That was a uh, tremendous, a real tour de force um, from someone who's been there and done that and got the scars on their back. <laughs> We're going to have some questions at the end. So everybody who wants to put questions, can you please put your questions into the Q&A uh, and we'll do it all at the end. But I've just got one question. You talked a lot about effective lens position. How much do you think the tilt and the sort of lateral translocation and, and sideways movement of an IOL within its effective position after surgery has an effect? Well, you know, there is definitely lens IOL tilt, and we've looked at the relationship between the crystalline lens tilt and the IOL tilt. And to, to be more clear, the IOL is tilted so that it's the nasal part is anterior and the temporal part is posterior. And it can be on average about five degrees, which doesn't do much in terms of IOL power. But if you're one of those eyes that has a 10 degree tilt, it actually can have quite an effect on toricity. Um, but a, a, a tilted IOL that's decentered a little bit, Paul, to your point, probably will impact the ELP. And we haven't gotten anywhere near figuring that out because we don't have a way yet to, to calculate IOL tilt. None of the devices give us IOL tilt, so we're kind of stuck there. Good question. Well, thank you very much. So, Doug, thank you very much. We're